Welcome to ZCast, everyone. I'm ZS Caraval from ZK Research, and I'm here at Black Hat 2024 in Vegas. I'm with Sam Curry. You're the CISO for Zscanner. That's right, yeah. Uh, can you just uh, give us a quick intro on yourself, your bio, and what you do there? Uh, so, um, I, as you said, I'm a global VP and CISO in residence at Zscaler. I'm also a fellow at the National Security Institute. I teach at a few uh, colleges in the Boston oh. area, too, uh, Wentworth and Nichols, if you know them. I know them, yeah. Uh, I'm a fellow, as I said, at the National Security Institute. I've been in cyber for longer than we've called it that. Um, <laughs> I think I got to know Zscaler first when I was the CTO at RSA. And uh, I've been a customer twice, so that's oh, why I came on board. So you got a long history with Zscaler. I do indeed. I yeah, do indeed. Yeah, so good fun. Yeah, as I mentioned, we're we are at Black Hat here. I know your role here is you're talking to a lot of customers. Yeah, uh, more so it's than the main reason such. to be here. Yeah, actually. yeah. yeah. And um, uh, what are the kind of things they're they're telling you today? Is it uh, you know has it has it so cyber is always a problem. <laughs> it seems yeah. whenever you look at IT priorities, cyber is always one or two, generally number one. Um, what are the conversations like today versus a year ago, a couple of years ago? Has anything changed? Well, of course, a couple of years ago, we were still post-COVID, right? Yeah. So that so that we had come out of that and that still dominated the conversation. I think a year ago, um, I think AI dominated the conversation. Now that conversation is, I'd say, more mature. I don't think it's where it needs to be yet. And we, yeah, we might mature, talk about that. Kind of, mature, yeah. meaning yeah. it's moved ahead a bit. And I think we've seen, I don't think we've seen yet what we could do with it. I don't think there's enough innovation. I'd agree with yet. that, yeah. Um, and uh, but I think one of the main reasons that cyber is always on the agenda is that there's an intelligent opponent finding ways to to come at us in new ways. Yeah, and that doesn't but, happen in other areas of IT. But uh, yeah. you, you asked about customers, so yeah. number one thing people are asking about right now is resilience or anti fragility. Right, they're, they're painfully aware that they have single points of failure, and and while this used to be a big topic in IT, it seems to be resurfacing now. Yeah. I'm guessing because um, of CrowdStrike and Paris Core cutting and everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and what what happened with the with the cutting? What happened with with CrowdStrike, of course? But um, frankly, this sort of thing is always happening to some degree. And these, when they become more visible like this, people are like, wait a minute. Yeah. You know what's happening with uh, QA? What's happening with availability? Where could I go down? Where do I not? I do think the timing of those months? events before Black Hat was good because it did bring a kind of renewed focus to the show. I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. But it's the sort of thing that should be front and center when we think about our supply chains yeah. anyway. Um, the other thing that people are asking about is, uh, aside from resilience um, and, we, and AI generally, is they're asking, how can I get more efficiencies in IT? So yeah, I've got to, I've got to reduce risk, but um, how do I actually transform IT? And I think that notion, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. I think rather than just how do I take any technology that comes along and just do more of the same. Um, sometimes we need to be a bit more rebellious, I think, and, and rethink what we're doing, right? And, and that's it's difficult. Change requires, yeah. nobody likes change. It requires leadership, often cultural change. Nobody wants the cheese moved. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, just, I ran a, a survey um, recently looking at AI and, and infrastructure. One of the questions I asked was the role of, uh, of the network um, compared to two years ago. 93% said it was more important, uh, but then 80% said it was also more complex. And so this concept of simplification uh, really needs to become true because I think we're, we're rapidly approaching a point where, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure has always gotten more complex <laughs> and it's always gotten more important, right? You think back to the days of, you know, maybe mainframes, the importance level was maybe this big and the complexity was, you know, but, but as these things keep diverging, we're going to reach a point eventually where your complexity overwhelms IT mm. and you can't support it anymore. And so I think there's been this attempted focus to simplify operationally. Um, it seems like we're still falling behind. And I think part of that is operational methodology. Uh, people like to do things the only way, as you said, they don't like change. And um, you know. I, I, had a, I had a challenge from a friend of mine years ago. He said, if you, if you took all of the bits and bobs that we have in, in IT and you went back in time, and you handed them some and said, what would you do with this? They wouldn't build what we've built. Probably not, right. Right. Uh, they, they would probably do something very different. They might do something better. They might do something worse. Uh, there's a term, Neil Stevenson wrote a book called Seven Eves, which is really fascinating. He came up with this term, omnistics, which is that what we do with technology is very cultural based. It's very based on what we do today. Um, but the, And re-architecture, to some degree, is a dirty word. I mean, it's almost as bad as data migration. Nobody likes either of those yeah. things, right? Well, nobody re-architects. You put new architecture in, you keep the legacy stuff. And yeah. so the reason that you get this, call it complicated infrastructure, is because we take the old and we just take this technology and we just say, hey, let's go and 
let's take let's take that uh, let's take that station wagon and let's go and strap some jet engines on it. Well, that's not the vehicle you necessarily want for, right? You 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 may want to say, well, what platform should we be using? Maybe we should rethink the platform. That's a difficult decision mm. to make when you've invested years in the station wagon. Mm. And, and uh, I think it's time for us to say, wait a minute, have we gone sufficiently far that we need to rethink that? And so do we need a lot of the hardware we drag forward? Um, so let's take, let's take uh, Zero Trust, right? In the case of Zero Trust, a lot of the firewalls that we use, a lot of the hardware that we use, the VPNs, do we really need to make something that's basically firewall as a service, right? Uh, that, that's effectively what people are building, which is naturally gonna get much more complicated. You can have complexity yes, yes. without being complicated. That's harder to troubleshoot. It's harder to find the problems. And you're making a much more open and flat network as a result. You could instead rethink it and use things like logical segmentation and app segmentation, which is not what people do by default that requires rethinking IT. And you could get, rather than more time in IT spent doing plumbing, you could become a, a broker instead of a custodian of IT services. And that's more interesting for an IT yeah. job as well. And so that's why we get to efficiency discussions, right? How do I actually take advantage of this? Uh, unfortunately, historically, it's usually taken a, a forcing function. An analogy I used the other day was in, in, in World War I, when tanks first appeared on the battlefield, they weren't used in ways that were innovative. They were peanut buttered, right? And so it yeah. wasn't, people didn't concentrate them until later in the war. Uh, the same thing has happened with drones on a battlefield. It took uh, the conflict in the Ukraine for people to start finding new ways to do it. And boy, drone warfare has advanced in just two years. Yes. Yeah. Right. And and maybe these are not good examples for yeah. for, hum for humanity, um, but they are examples of what happens under pressure. And I think well, what maybe the necessity saying, is. Yeah. Suddenly you wake yeah. up and go, wait a minute, the threat landscape has become so bad. Um, and the ability to, to diagnose this stuff has become such a threat to business and new invest, investment that it's time to rethink and re-architect. And so you can have complexity without it being complicated. I right? got it, so yeah. you can get that simplification might give you more capacity than you had before. Let, let me ask you a question too around the concept of uh, consolidation. Hmm. You know, this came up, uh, this has come up over and over in the media anyways with the, a renewed focus on cyber resiliency. Mm -hmm. um, there was a big move to uh, converge and consolidate security. Uh, the question has been raised, though, in the in the light of what happened with CrowdStrike, is consolidation a bad thing? Should have vendor redundancy? Um, I agree. You can actually do both, right? You can consolidate some functions and you can add new capabilities. But what are customers telling you? Do they want to? Uh, how much do they? Like, obviously, nobody wants to have two hundred vendors like some companies have today. But they also don't have one. What's the right level of consolidation? Well, I think if you can architect your network with current vendors and you can architect your stack to have the right level of redundancy and failover. So for instance, I think if you had an identity platform, if you have an endpoint platform, if you have a networking and connectivity platform, right? So for instance, if you take CrowdStrike and Zscaler, um, we both do, say, antivirus, just pick a basic function. We do ours in stream and they do theirs on the endpoint, on the server, et cetera, and in the cloud. Those reinforce each other rather than are completely redundant to one another, yeah. right? So you've got, it's defense in depth, but you know, defense in depth in the old days was the cry of the failed security vendor, right? So they failed, you'd call them up and go, why'd you fail? They said, you should have had defense in depth. And that, that's just BS. I think defense in depth done right is that the various layers are coordinated together and greater than the sum of the parts, right? So it's the better together story. And so you could say, all right, I've got platforms for various parts of my estate but if I ever unify all of them, then I'm starting to get to a weak point. Any one of these could have an issue and I should hold them each accountable for having less and less single points of failure and doing QA right and being more, call it anti-fragile, right? I mean, resilience is really a measure of health. We used to, uh, we said that chaos monkey, right? And right, right, yeah. You take, you take things out and you see what breaks and you make sure that you can handle that thing going away. I used to run a directory many years ago where we had like six directories running and how many could we take down out of the, out of the stack and they'd keep running and keep services going in at the right SLA. Um, you should be able to do that kind of test. And over time, they should get better at it. So the answer to your question is, I think, rather than one monolithic vendor, you should be thinking about how do you have partially overlapping smaller platforms for part of the security yeah. state, and how do they work with the wider IT? And then you think in terms of, well, how do I make sure that when part of it goes down, I keep service going? And that's why business continuity and disaster recovery are separate disciplines from each other and from the rest of IT. Got it. The, the other challenge with all that is to do so efficiently. Um, and there's a notion of commoditization. Every part of IT, except to some extent cyber so far, 
there's a commoditization pressure. So the quality is the same everywhere. And there are many sources. I, I think there's parts of cyber that have gone through that. I mean, crypto, no, when cryptography was no, the well, when you, and you look at like, well, maybe not commodity, so but, far. but I mean, certainly standard, standard, standardization. I don't think yeah. there's a lot of difference between, uh, you know, uh, and an, I, an IPS from one vendor to another. They, you know, they've mm -hmm. all. Um, totally and, right. Yeah. And that's why so many of those functions have consolidated down to a next gen firewall because those are large. And I, and I think you're seeing that with SSE, CASB, SWIG, things like that will eventually become fairly standardized. And then everything will yeah, eventually, yeah. except where uh, but, they differentiate on new features. Yeah. Well, so security has got a big opponent. Security has a much bigger leading edge than other areas. That's, that's what that, they, see, yeah. what keeps us on our toes is the opponent. Right? Yeah. And that's what, so that's why we have so many startups. That's why you get, if you get too monolithic and you can't innovate fast enough, um, that's why those companies get disrupted over time. Yeah. And uh, so the other hot topic here, uh, and you see signs for it every, or is AI, obviously, right? Oh, yeah. And, and AI has been kind of a funny... Top of the bingo card. Yeah. It's been kind of a, an interesting topic in that everyone's talking about it. it. In fact, it reminds me a lot of when I started my IT career where people wanted, everyone had to have an internet strategy, but nobody knew what that meant, right? Now everybody has to have a, an AI strategy. And an AOL or something. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> right. and within security... Um, there's been some kicking the tires on using AI as almost like an, a sock assistant or something. Yeah, um, which is unimaginative, I think. Yeah. And my apologies to all those startups that just groaned. But, yeah. yeah, and well, um, so what is the role of AI in security? Like, it, it I, isn't, I, don't, it I don't see too many people willing to just hand the operations over to a virtual... I think one day we'll look back at that question and be like, it's sort of like asking, what is the role of a compiler in, in programming, right? It's, yeah. Um, to some degree, what everyone has said is, ooh, I can make a co-pilot. And that word has become synonymous with AI. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, I think that's just the bare bones. It's the equivalent of let's peanut butter. And there, I think yeah, they're- LLM equals AI. Right? LLM equals AI equals yeah. co-pilot. Yeah. And let's go do something in the sock with that. That's not that interesting. And in fact, that could be dangerous for a number of reasons. Um, I, did a, a paper, I did a presentation called Mirror Chess a while ago. Any form of automation is a thing that can be exploited. Like when you're playing chess against someone and you start to mirror your opponent, there's asymmetry and your opponent can take advantage of it and beat you because of it. So it's not a good strategy. But you can actually wind up having people that, that just respond to the AI's prompts and don't understand where they come from. And the AI itself can, not only can it be abused, it can be predicted by the opponent. And so that's not necessarily a good thing over time. And so there, but there are other applications. We can use it in deception. We can use it to actually do naming of lures and baits and things like files and mimic human behavior so that we can really make fake networks that are efficient and fairly inexpensive. No one's talking about that yet. Yeah. And, but the, the application, the true use of AI, I think, for the short term is not just assisted humans, because yes, we're clearly in that phase and that's part of it. It's efficiencies in creation of tools, it's deception, and it is very specific cogs in the machine and sometimes in coordination of the machine. So what do you do to get better risk scores? What do you do to get better identification of malware? Yeah. How do you find the and ghost And a lot of that will be happening automatically, right? And well, or I mean, under the covers. It, it will appear to be that yeah, way, yeah. but the, it's actually not so, that trivial to I've develop. always said, I think, you know when a technology has arrived when we stop talking about it. Yeah, the, I, the plateau of productivity yeah. is regarded. I remember like early in my career, you know, when the internet was first on the rise, we used to go to internet conferences. We don't have internet conferences anymore because nobody has proved yeah. the value. Nobody asked you about the ROI, right? And eventually AI will become that way. It'll just become an embedded component of, that's right. of everything that's done. And better analytics will be done, better automation will be done, but we won't really think of it as AI. It'll just be the next wave of evolution of the tool. So, yeah, yeah. yeah you're totally right. Yeah. Um, but, but I also think that finding, there's more to AI than just LLMs. Yeah. The rest of the toolkit includes a lot of things with, from machine learning to other applications. And there's new things coming that are even potentially more disruptive. But I think the thing about LLMs is it caught the public imagination. And we started to think about how average people would use it. Yeah. And it made computers cross the uncanny valley, meaning computers could start to act like humans. And we started to infer a lot, a lot with that that maybe it didn't need, but it, I mean, look at, look at ChatGPT. It was the fastest growing product in history, right? I think it was 100 million users in two months. I think so, yeah. Something, which is incredible. So that caught the public imagination, and of course, it sparked investment. As, and so Cory Doctorow actually said, it's a bubble, right? All interesting things are bubbles. The question is if they leave value behind after, and this one does. 
Now, the rest of the AI toolkit is interesting. And as that gets applied, we're going to start to see those. Nobody really knows it's happening, but those who understand the tech will find new, really interesting applications. And that's what we want to watch for. That's the interesting stuff. Yeah. Okay. And so, so last question, but mm. since you are so customer facing, with all this, we got increased complexity, we got more use of cloud, right? AI is coming, folks on digital resilient, resiliency. What are you recommending to customers right now? What are, uh, for people watching this, what are the two to three things you'd recommend they do to help them get a handle on what they're doing, simplify, but also make sure that they are you know, modernized and, and ready for yeah, whatever so, comes. Um, so number one is uh, honestly zero trust principles. Um, zero trust isn't the thing you go, okay, we're there, we're done. It is removed, access is proportional, access in, in, uh, is proportional to trust, trust is proportional to risk. So start to reduce the default access that you have. That means become less visible online. That means reduce the amount of lateral movement that's possible, simplify the environment, right? Now, that's not necessarily easily done. That's the number one thing. The number two thing is, frankly, cyber is really a social problem. And I think we often forget that. The biggest problem in cyber isn't technical. Yes. It is the gap between cyber and the business and being understood across that divide. Become business people first. And most of what you should be doing is sneakerware. It is, in fact, winning hearts and minds, whether you're a CISO or lower in the organization than that. It is about winning hearts and minds and gaining influence and actually stopping and saying, wait, rather than just saying no, how do I find a way to say yes to some things? Um, do I need to say no to this application or can I find circumstances under which it's yes and how do I do that? That I think is probably the best way to do it because you don't want to be turning up and saying, hey, I've got, I've got this thing that I want to do and everyone goes, here we go. You know, Mrs. CISO thinks or Mr. CISO thinks that, that all this is is about them and reduction of risk. They don't understand my MBOs or what I have to achieve. Yeah. And instead, when you turn up and go, hey, I want to help you achieve these things, the strategic goal, increasing revenue, lowering costs, or customer sat, they suddenly go, who are you? Okay, now they know when you turn up, it's not just for that, and they're willing to help you with your thing. That's a huge hmm. breakthrough, um, thinking like a business person first. All right, well, those are good things to think about. Zero trust and thinking Thanks like a business me. person, and uh, IT doesn't often do that, though, but there's more and more of that here. I so think, by the way, good. the reason for yeah. zero trust isn't just for its own sake, it will future-proof us. Oh, so. no, I, I'm a big zero trust fan. I, uh, I've described it to people as the first rethink of networking in a long time, right? Traditional networks are based on the principle that everything can talk to everything, which it's is great. Cash law, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's go maximize yeah. everything. And, and that's, that's why things connect so fast, but the downside of that is because everything talks to everything when you're breached, now you have unfettered access to everything. So AI zero is trust. Find new ways yeah. to attack. Yeah. And th ways we didn't expect on avenues we didn't expect. So we should close those doors. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, appreciate having you on. Thanks for having me. Thanks. So uh, on behalf of Sam Curry, I'm Zia Scaravalo from ZK Research saying uh, thanks for watching. Uh, please hit the subscribe button. I'll see you next time. My next episode is ZCast. Thanks. Thanks.